So, hi everybody. So, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna give everybody a couple of minutes to get connected to audio and everything. Morning in progress. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so thank you all for coming and for joining us today. Um, so my name is Danielle Lynch, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the Assistant Director of Domestic Violence Advocacy at the YWCA, and I office outside of the Palomar Building. And so I'm really excited for um, everybody to be here and for today's panel, um, looking at the barriers to safety. So today we're really going to talk about kind of the barriers that people may face whenever they reach out for assistance, maybe some of the barriers to reaching out to assistance, and some of the tools that um, people may have to help and some of the tools and resources that we don't have um, or maybe are lacking as a society. So, um, and really kind of look at how to best provide support when we're working with clients um, who are experiencing intimate partner violence. So to begin, I'm gonna have each of our panelists introduce themselves and share a little bit about themselves and um, the work that they do. So let me see, I still got a couple people joining here. So <clears throat> we'll start with um, Hyra. Um, Hyra, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and kind of share a little bit about? Um, hi, uh, my name is Hyra Camarena, and I am the founder and executive director of La Luz Organization. And we are a culturally specific faith-based um, service provider certified by the Attorney General's Office to provide crisis services to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. That's me. All right. Um, Dedrick and Riley, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm Riley Cleveland. Uh, I'm currently working as a therapist at Oakwood Springs Behavioral Health Hospital um, doing inpatient care. Um, I previously was an intern and worked at the YWCA in the shelter for a total of about two years. And I'm Dr. Perkins and I am moisturizing. Um, <laughs> I, um, like Riley, work at Oakwood Springs. Um, we actually interned and worked together at the YWCA in the University Shelter. Um, currently, um, I am, along with this, I am an adjunct professor for the School of Social Work at the U. Um, and yeah, total advocate and radical feminist and ready to um, discuss. All right, Brittany, you wanna? Hello, I am Brittany Crow. I am the animal advocate with the Oklahoma Humane Society housed at Palomar, and I serve uh, clients' animal-related needs, including temporary foster placement assistance for their animals while they flee, um, pet deposit assistance for when they get safe housing, pet supply assistance, veterinary care assistance, essentially anything animal-related that a client may need um, to be able to stay with their animals um, while they flee and get to safe housing. But I also do owner surrender assistance if that can't happen. So just anything animal-related, I'm your go-to gal. <laughs> and then next we have Ladesha with the Homeless Alliance. Ladesha, you wanna? Hello, uh, my name is Ladesha DeBose. I am the team lead housing navigator with the Homeless Alliance. Uh, I am embedded here at Palomar. I also have another coworker that is also a housing navigator that is embedded here. And then we also have another housing navigator embedded at the YWCA. Um, the three of us work to provide clients with permanent and stable housing, um, either with or without um, 
assistance if they need, but to get them into permanent stable housing. So as we get started on the panel, I'd really love for there to be audience participation. So please feel free to ask any questions that you may have for any of the panelists. Um, at any point, you can post them in the chat. Um, you can also send them to me directly if you don't feel comfortable um, sharing them publicly, or you can also unmute yourself, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, and I'm really excited to have you all here. Um, as a reminder, we are gonna be discussing some pretty difficult things. So please do what you need to do to take care of yourself. I know that these are never um, easy topics to talk about, even um, if you uh, are in this line of work. And so um, I just wanna kind of give that reminder. So it's always good to, good to have. Um, so to get started, I just kind of want to start by asking one of the most commonly commonly asked questions that survivors of intimate partner violence get asked is, why don't you just leave? Can you explain some of the reasons that a person may not be able to just leave or an abusive situation? And that can be for whoever wants to go first. Um, I think that the common ones that I think go throughout any ethical or race is basically like the fear of leaving. We know that leaving doesn't necessarily make it safer for the victim. Um, the violence does escalate once they leave. Um, but for the Latino community, there's a lot of barriers that come with leaving um if they were the only ones working and she is undocumented how is she going to work um we have seen at la luz that a lot of our clients are being brought from another state so they're living in rural areas so transportation do they know how to drive um do they have friends or family here or is it only like the family of the abuser that is out here are they being supportive so why do they stay? All these things come to play when we have a Latina victim of domestic violence of why she might choose to stay. Her kids, love, right? All those regular things that that um, we see that why victims stay. But for Latinas, there's a lot more barriers <clears throat> um, just than that. Like I said, those, um, those undocumented barriers of uh, finding employment, transportation, family, friends, income, um, the scare of losing their children, being deported, et cetera. There's also a lot of fear and shame, guilt, embarrassment. Um, people don't always know how to talk to their loved ones or their support systems or the people around them. Um, about what they're experiencing without feeling shamed or like they might be blamed for putting themselves in the situation when that's not the case. Um, that guilt and embarrassment and shame can hold a lot of people back from leaving if they don't feel like they're going to be believed or that they have somebody that they can trust to confide in with what's going on. I also think um, in a clinical setting, um, a lot of survivors, um, depending on the level of trauma that they experience as a child, um, also into adulthood, they just may not know that there's another way of life. Um, they may not have been exposed to a type of love that doesn't hurt or doesn't um, require them to um, diminish or dismiss themselves. Um, I think also, um, specifically with Black women, there's this idea that um, they can um, they can pray him right, right? Uh, I say specifically Black women because that's what I know, but there's this like idea that um, if I um, dismiss and diminish my power enough for this person, um, he will act right, um, act right being be safe. Um, and sometimes thinking about religious abuse as well um how 
uh, misogynistic and kind of uh, patriarchal that can be. Um, and so connecting the fact that um, for Black Americans, um, they're more likely to be involved in church organization as their support system. And then being in that environment of misogyny and um, patriarchy, um, you think they're, it's supporting and reinforcing this idea that you have to stay with them. You can't leave. You're married. You're supposed to stay there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think all of those um, kind of um, coincide to create the perfect storm for someone to feel like they're, they can't get out of the situation. I think... Um, on the clinical side too, sometimes people are waiting for somebody to ask and if nobody's asking, they're not saying anything. Mm -hmm. And there's clinicians, doctors, nurses, whoever that just aren't asking questions to assess that level of safety. And therefore, because of the stereotypes and stigma and shame and guilt, they're not saying anything. <laughs> Thank you for that. I would also like to add. Guys, um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I I was I was trying to, and I didn't unmute myself. So go ahead. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, I was just going to say, I was just going to piggyback. Someone mentioned fear. Um, I'd just like to add on to that and say fear of being homeless, um, because if they don't have the support system of family or friends or a neighbor, um, then it's like, you know, where are they going to go, especially if they have children. Some people are more willing to become homeless if it's just them, um, but they have children involved. And it's like, you know, my kids, what am I going to do with my kids? We can't just sleep, you know anywhere we have to have a place to sleep also uprooting their children out of school you know what's going to happen with school what are what are we going to do um they may have to leave their job you know i'm not going to have money so i feel like the fear of all those things of like what am i going to do after this what am i going to do after that um is also because it's hard to you know make a plan whenever you're in survival mode all the time okay can you guys hear me now Okay, cool. And so for my clients, obviously the animals are the barrier to safety or an additional barrier. Um, like the most recent statistics are that 65% uh, of DV victims feel unable to escape because of fear of what may happen to their pet. And 71% that make DV shelters have reported already that the perpetrator has either threatened, injured, or already killed family pets. So for my clients, I mean, the human animal bond is just so imperative uh, to a lot of people because that's unconditional love that a lot of my clients, that's the only thing that they have. I have had clients just bawl their eyes out, even when I'm here just to help and get their animals into foster, they're the separation of the only thing they have left in the world is just so majorly traumatic because that's, I mean, that's, that's what they've got. That's what has helped them through it. And they, a lot of times will just stay because they, they will never allow something to happen to like the love of their lives. And, uh, I mean, I think the stats are that, um, some, a lot of people will live in their car for up to four months because DV shelters don't have, you know, pet accommodations on site. I think it's only 12% nationwide that have pet accommodations. And so all, I have several clients that will be homeless and not even go into shelters. They'll just sleep under trees because they will not leave their pets or be separated from them for any length of time, even if it's into a kennel. So it's just, it, it's a really, really big deal. I mean, this year alone, I've already served over 200 people and over 450 animals. And since we started, I'm almost at a thousand people and 2000 animals since we just started in 2017. And that's just what one person can do because I'm a one person program. And so that is such a small percentage of the need I get. I have to say no more than I say yes, um, because there just aren't foster home placements. And so I, I literally have so many clients right now that are just wandering with their animals, like waiting for foster placement assistance. So yeah, big deal for me. <laughs> Right. So we heard lots of different barriers and lots of different um, reasons. Does anybody want to piggyback off that or share, add to that or add anything else to that question? 
I know that's something that we could have a whole um, a whole panel on just in and of itself is you know kind of some of those barriers that prevent people from leaving and sometimes they may not even want to. So um, the next question, why is asking questions like, why don't you just leave harmful to survivors and what is a better way to respond? I think it's harmful because if they, if they could leave, they would. If it was that easy, they would. And so it's, it's almost insulting and undermining because of course they've thought about that, right? Like, of course that has been a thought in their mind probably at some point of, I need to leave or maybe I should leave like once it's gotten to that point. And so asking somebody is almost, it's just undermining their ability to think for themselves. Um, and so I think that's definitely why it's harmful. And instead of, I mean, that's just one reason. Um, instead of asking that, just ask how you can help. You know, what do you need? How can I help you? What do you, what would help you to get out of this situation if you're ready? Um, so since we're already in the new bit, I'll go ahead. I think asking someone, why don't you just leave is akin to asking um, a child, why are you acting this way? Um, I think a better question is what happened? What's going, what happened to you that this behavior is going on? Um, so I think a better way to ask that question of why don't you just leave is where, where, did, where along in your life did it become okay for this? Or do you realize that it's okay? Mm -hmm. um, I think as clinicians, um, we can dig a bit deeper. I think as advocates, um, you have the opportunity to be in the space with someone to really ask them those types of questions in a comfortable, safe space. Mm -hmm. um, what happened to you? What did you see as a child that made this okay? Um, what did you? What is? What is he giving you? Right. Um, what feelings are he giving? Is he giving you? Um, we feel like you can survive without them. There's so many other questions you can ask um, that would lead to a deep. And it's getting sorry to interrupt. It's getting just a little bit harder to hear you. So I want to. Oh, talk. they're so sorry. There's. So, <laughs> I was trying not to yell because there's an echo <laughs> in this room. Um, but I think there's a deeper. I think the 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 point is to ask for a deeper level of insight. Um, for why it is that they're in the position that they're in um, versus just as Riley was saying, blaming them. Why don't you just leave? Why can't you just leave? Because essentially they're not going to leave until they realize that they need to. Um, so if you can create an environment, create a conversation that creates a deeper level of insight, then they can reflect on that for themselves. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I agree with both. Um, it's just, it like for us, I like asking like if, what would you like to do, right? So if they're saying, uh, well, I want to leave, what are some obstacles that you have faced in the past? Have you left before? What maybe you, what happened? Why did you want to, why did you come back? Um, exploring that in questions that are not victim blaming and um, getting a response from them of what might had worked and what didn't work. Um, maybe they need to leave the state. Maybe um, their teenage kid reached out to him and you know they he knew where they were at. So we cannot explore that again, going to the same location. So just really having those questions of conversation. Anyone else want to add anything? I'll add something. I think a lot of times chaos is a lot more comfortable and the unknown is terrifying. And so it's a lot easier to stay in something where you know exactly what to expect. Whereas outside of that, like what's life going to be like? Uh, you know, I recently had a client that went all the way back out of state to be back 
with the abuser because in her life here, it was quiet and that was uncomfortable. And so it's really important to ask the questions. Thankfully, she came back and it's like, what can I do to support you and make, make you feel comfortable in your life outside of this? Because if you just, you know, abandon people and say, well, glad you left. Um, good luck. I mean, they, they need a lot more support than that, especially if they don't have a family or community here. And especially for me, I mean, the animal connection is so great. I feel like I'm able to bond so well with people just because of our mutual love for animals. And I feel like they trust me so much. And it's just something as simple as that is like creating that trust with somebody so that they feel safe within their life outside of that abuse because quiet is so uncomfortable and being alone is so uncomfortable. If you've never been that way before, my client had been married for almost 30 years. She'd never been alone. I mean, how, how do we expect people to stay when it's just so bizarre and something that they've never known before? Yeah, that's an excellent point. It's not just leaving, it's kind of that support afterwards. I just had one thing to add. Um, I agree with everything everyone has said. Um, someone mentioned something about victim blaming, and I think that um, really hits home because it's victim blaming, it's harmful, and I feel like it's placing the blame in the wrong place. Um, when instead we should be placing the blame on, you know, who is the one hurting them. And I would like to say that it kind of goes back to reinforcing the patriarchy. You know, we're asking, you know, the one person like, oh, why didn't you leave? Why have you done this? Or why didn't you do this? Instead of asking like, you know, are they being held accountable? You know, why did they do this or something? So I feel like it's placing the blame in the wrong place. Um, again, and just reinforcing that the patriarchy and the stigma um, surrounded by it. Does anybody want to add anything to any of their answers or piggyback off of anything? There's a lot of really great information, great answers shared. So as a community, where do you feel like we fall short on, in on ensuring that survivors have access to services and have services available? Um, I think specifically um, for Black women, um, we don't always have a culturally um, a, a, cult a, a culturally accepting space for them, right? Um, so if you consider the fact that um, for most Black Americans, there's this thing called code switching, right? Where depending on what environment you're in, you're switching your behaviors, your mannerisms, your even to and to a degree your personality, right? You're leaving part of yourself out of the room to make other people feel comfortable. And so imagine doing that at work, outside of life, and then doing that within your relationship. Because even though you're not code switching for your race, you're code switching for safety. Right. And now they come to you, um, receive services, they come to the shelter. Um, and like just for instance, in here, I can't see everybody, but like just what you're seeing now, you're only seeing two black people, right? Like so if they walk into Palomar, the YWCA, they're gonna uh, their brains automatically trigger to go into that code switching mode, which doesn't allow them to be upfront and honest about what they're really experiencing. So I think it's important that they have representation within the services that they're seeing. So that would be um, clinicians, that would be in therapy, uh, in groups, that would be in advocates, that would be in all of these things to allow them to feel represented and seen. Um, I'm gonna piggyback off of that. Like he said, there's only two African American and I'm the only Latina. Um, and usually that's how it is everywhere that we go. There's very li little, um, like my teenage calls it, peace, POC. Uh, I'm learning um, teenage language. Um, but it's very important to have representation. And for the Latino community, I feel like it starts at home in our families. A lot of the times here in Oklahoma, I've seen um, that there's a lot of people like first generations going to school 
and the mentality of these of the parents is well you're already 15 at the age that i was like at your age i was already working i was already doing this so they're taking them out from school and not really encouraging them like to go to college but more of encouragement to go to work because either they're a single mom and she needs the support or it's something that it's a custom. So I've taken upon myself to really try to focus on like reaching out to like the teenagers and and letting them know that there's a, a world of the nonprofit um, that needs bilingual people in the workforce to help our own community. Um, because we are culturally specific and everybody here speaks Spanish, but we still have jobs pending for over six months because we cannot find qualified people. So if we're lacking in the profession, then we're lacking in the educational part to educate our community that we're even here, um, speaking Spanish, fully Spanish to help them and guide them through the system. Um, so there's a lack of education just everywhere for the Latino community in providing um, culturally specific services. I know this is more of a um, domestic violence, but the word acecho means stalking. And uh, in the Latino community, they don't know what acecho means. So if they don't know what the word stalking means in Spanish, how can they identify the victimization? So a lot of education, a lot of um, resources in that needs to be, they. We need resources, financial support, to provide and spend a lot of this time out in the community. We're a small organization, so we need the educational support to be out there every single day in the community and then have also the support to be here providing direct victim services to the clients that are going to be coming in. So there's just a lack of education and a lack of funding. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and for me, unfortunately, animals get pushed to the bottom of the priority list, but they are not low priority for my clients. And the stats back that up. Um, this is a huge barrier to safety and animal advocacy needs a seat at the table everywhere that everybody else is. Like we're doing it well, we're at the Family Justice Center, but this is not like this everywhere else. Um, they need a, we need a seat at the table at DV shelters, you know, just everywhere that everyone else is like animal advocacy needs to be prioritized as well, because like I said, it's a big priority to my clients. I think we're also lacking um, in education in terms of like teenagers, youth, young adults, um, just because I've met so many of our clients even here that don't recognize that what they experienced was abuse or was stalking or was whatever, because nobody told them. And I think we really fail young people in not giving them the, the education that they need about healthy relationships, signs to look out for. There are some great programs that do that, but I don't think they're widespread enough. And I don't think it's talked about enough within families. Um, and part of that has to do with the family system if that family is dysfunctional that's what that child or teenager is going to see um but i think we just really lack an education about what to look out for starting from a young age and i want to jump on that with riley domestic violence intimate partner violence is not a woman's issue it is a men's issue and so we keep talking about education and so we're trying to educate women to point out, the, to find the signs, we should be educating young men how to handle their emotions, how to express their emotions outside of being violent. So I think that that should be the focus. That should always be the focus. It's not, it's not about trying to have a woman notice or a young woman notice the signs of abuse. It's about making sure that young men are not doing um, in the Latino community, there is this talk, there is this word on TikTok. Well, it's everywhere. It's like gone viral. It's toxica and toxico. So it's toxic, but they're glamorizing it. Like you'll see people, you'll probably, you've probably seen, um, like the car decals that say like my daughter is toxica or my wife is toxica on the car because they're glamorizing this toxic behavior and they're making it okay. 
So um, I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago of being in a conference with young kids um, in high school. And it was like, the it was so awkward for all of us um, because I was educating them on not glamorizing the word toxico that like it's gone viral with TikTok and Instagram. Um, but it's very important, like he's Derek saying, um, educating young men that this, they could also be victims. So not because you're a man means that you're shield um, and explaining and educating on what that means and how does toxica and toxico really do mean domestic violence behavior and it's not okay. Anybody else want to add anything? I would just like to add on, I think with all the things that they've said, um, also a part of that is accountability. Um, I feel like, you know, if you have a friend that is, you know, maybe violent with their significant other or something like that, I feel like, you know, it's, you should hold them accountable. You should call them out on their actions. You know, if they're behaving in a way that's not okay, I feel like if you're a true friend, you should call them out on it and you should let them know they like, you know, hey, that's that's not okay to treat this person this way. Um, I think that's a huge deal as well, because I feel like people are kind of like, you know, not my relationship, not my business kind of thing, um, which is true, I guess, if they think, but things can always end up very, you know, very different. Things can be very severe and have very sad endings. Um, so I think it's okay to like, you know, again, hold that accountability just because you're holding them accountable doesn't mean you're butting into the relationship. Absolutely. Anyone else want to piggyback off of anything or add anything? So the next um, question. So can you all kind of share a little bit about the impact that mandatory reporting has on somebody reaching out for services, whether that's mental health services, substance use services, housing, domestic violence um, services, but kind of what barriers or issues that that may prevent, present. So I think when people think of mandatory reporting, they're automatically thinking about children, right? They're thinking about CPS involvement. Um, when it... Oh, sorry. You just put me on mute, Sharon. I was trying to tell you that we couldn't hear you, and then I did. Oh, I made okay. it worse. Sorry, my bad, my bad. <laughs> so um, one of the things that um, Riley and I experienced here at Oakwood Springs, wait, what was, oh, when we think of mandatory reporting, we're thinking of children, we're thinking of CPS involvement. But one of the things that Riley and I experienced here is the use of um, maybe male privilege, male entitlement, um, to report um, some, a woman's hysteria or mental health issue. And so if they have a relationship or a connection with a mental health professional um, that believes them and trusts them, they can virtually say whatever needs to be said as a third party statement to have someone committed to a psychiatric hospital. As long as the licensed mental health professional feels like they're a danger to themselves or to the person that's reporting, that person can be placed on an emergency order of detainment, right? And so under this whole mandatory reporting, no one's asking questions. So this person gets checked into a psychiatric hospital and their therapist is like, well, what's going on? And they were just like, I, I was just feeling my emotions and he was uncomfortable, right? Um, I, that's a that's a very basic kind of answer, obviously for HIPAA. But I think um, expanding our idea of what mandatory reporting really um, encompasses, aside from just children. And I think just the obvious answer, too, maybe not obvious. I don't know, but 
um, just the fear that if we are talking about children, that those children will be taken away, whether that's because they're reporting domestic violence or whether that's because they are reporting that they are suicidal and they're afraid of somebody might take away their children. Um, you know, and just just not knowing what will happen if they are honest about the things that are going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's so many challenges, oh, challenges that, that clients have shared. I mean, I don't like having like a box because then it puts victims like in a box because they all have different um, reasons. But one of the things that, well, the top three that we always hear is deportation. Um, there is a, a law in Mexico and Central and South America called um, Abandono de Hogar, which means abandonment of the home, which they are um, in these countries. If a woman leaves for whatever reason, um, they could go to jail. So the fear of that being an actual law here, it's always like, so refreshing to them to just know, no, that doesn't exist here. Um, plus, you're a victim of domestic violence, so you have um, you have that support towards them. And then um, losing their children and not having family in Oklahoma. Um, so we're seeing a lot of um, helping them get to another state um, where they do have that support system and really just education on what domestic violence is, um, victims' rights are, um, all those great things that they need to know to decide what they wanna do at that point. If they wanna work on leaving or if they are not ready and we plan around staying and hopefully one day being prepared to leave. Yeah, thank you for that. Anybody wanna to add to that question? Kind of some of the barriers or issues that the mandatory reporting guidelines may. I'm gonna add, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna add that um, for us, it's very important to be transparent with our clients. So when they walk in the door and it's our first time, we do let them know that we are mandated reporters. Anything that they disclose that puts a child or an elderly uh, elder in danger of harm, we do have to report, and we do the report together. Um, we don't. I we do not want to make them feel like oh they did that behind my back. They never told me. We're making the report together, and um, we we like sprinkling a little bit of like dumbness in our in our end where we have the information but we want like the cps report where who's taking the report to know that they are there so we will be verifying or we will be asking questions so they could hear that that person is there just that they don't speak english so we're helping them make the report together um for us to have that that trust because for me for us and I think for all advocates having that trust with clients it's crucial in helping them escape um, or just receive services if they feel like we're not trustworthy um, in the Latino community sometimes we might feel like you know we like gossiping so if they feel like oh no they're gonna gossip about me we're it's a done deal. Like even if they know the person um, and they know, they, they have no idea what that person is doing there, but they see that person, they recognize them, they're gonna leave because that they, they're not gonna risk having their business exposed. So I think that for us is really important, um, that transparency and trust, building trust with our clients and not tricking them like, oh no, it's, everything's gonna be okay. Go ahead and go home and then call and behind their back. It's doing the report with them educating on what might happen next, what's the typical, because we can't give legal advice, right? So what we have seen that has happened um, and what might be the outcome. And if we're at Palomar, then bringing one of those um, CPS workers down and letting them know like, hey, they're seeking services. They're here with me. Here's a release of, of consent, like to speak to you and building that trust with the client. And even with CPS and trusting us that, you know, that client is doing what they're supposed to be doing to protect the children and educating them that it's not about them. We're not against them. We're here to protect the children um, with CPS. So, 
Yeah. So I was going to say one of, I think one of the biggest concerns with mandated reporting is the safety risk it creates. Um, you know, our system, as far as DHS is concerned, isn't the most DV informed. Um, and so you get workers who get a referral um, and will go out and make contact with the abuser. Um, and then we're putting clients at risk. And so I think that that, that mandated part of that reporting, um, you know, we have to report it, but in what way do you do that safely? Um, and so I think that that is, is a huge barrier. So um, I think Kyra kind of started to answer a little bit about this, but what are some ways that um, if things do need to be reported that we can report while kind of maintaining client safety with a focus on that? I'm pretty sure Kyra um, answered that question. Yeah. Very thorough. Bye. Being able to do it and having having that collaborative effort with the client. Um, and I think the more information about the perpetrator that's available, um, the better, just so hopefully it reduces that risk that that is going to be the person that they contact that may not eliminate it completely. Um, but just being able to provide that information, I would think um, could help mitigate some of that. I'm going to add, um, I think I've said this before, but um, changing uh, DHS to CPS is crucial for the Latino community because DHS is also Department of Homeland Security, which is ICE. Um, so referring it to CPS takes a huge relief because, okay, you could make the report, but I don't want to get deported um, is one of the things that we hear a lot. And it's like, no. CPS is completely different than DHS. Um, so started, we started changing that DHS because in Oklahoma it is, in California it's CPS. Here in Oklahoma it's DHS. So when we got the, I got the habit of saying DHS and I started hearing the feedback of, I don't want to get deported. Um, will my children be able to leave with me or they're going to have to stay here? What should I do? And it's like, no, 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 that's not what we're doing here. Um, so educating, that's where the education came from, from my part. Um, and then just really calling them CPS rather than DHS. It's crucial for la the Latina community. Yeah. And I think that's a really good example of um, several of you have kind of mentioned having culturally specific services and people who know and recognize the needs of that community. And that's a really great example of that. And um, just, you know, how other people may not recognize um, that need or, um, you know, that's something that, you know, I personally can have never thought about. And so um, definitely something that I'll utilize moving forward. And, um, anybody else have anything they want to add to just kind of the mandated reporting conversation? I know it was touched on a little bit, but I think, you know, as we walk this journey alongside clients that we serve, um, anytime that we can kind of advocate on behalf of or accompany clients to meetings with their DHS worker or court is super beneficial, really talking about their protective capacities, really educating and informing um, DHS workers about you know, potential flashpoints or risk factors that are present for clients that we serve is really critical um, and paramount. But I think that, you know, if we can provide that additional support, then it not only is a benefit to the client, but also to help, you know, 
partner professionals in our community to broaden their understanding about domestic violence issues. And okay. so um, our next question kind of feeds into a little bit about um, some of the conversation that we are having, but in what ways might a service provider provider be may intend, sorry, I worded this question very weird. Um, what ways, what are some ways that a service provider may intentionally be perpetrating further harm to survivors when they reach out for help? And um, what are some ways that they can um, prevent it? So um, kind of referring to uh, DHS, the CPS, and making sure we're specifying that is a really great example. Uh, I, I have a lot to say about that, but I realize that I'm like monopolizing the conversation. Um, Oh, I, that's why you're a panelist. <laughs> okay. We want to hear you. So first, so first, it is formal legal system, right? Um, if, especially for women of color, um, brown and black women, the idea of going to VPO court, the idea of going to um, custody court, the idea of being involved with CPS, any of those formal systems, they're not going to want to do it, right? And so us as advocates have to be aware of that, right? We have to be aware that some of those systems, well, all of those systems, none of those systems were made for them, right? And so if we see that as their, um, if we see that as their primary safety protective factor, um, then we're not, opening up to the, we're, we're not opening up to their reality, right? I think the other barrier um, with providers um, is the, is their own. Mm. I would say again, their unwillingness to ask the question. Yeah. Um, which can continue to perpetrate harm mm -hmm. when somebody is calling to somebody that they trust or that they should be able to trust and they're not being met with the level of education that they need, willingness to have the difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Or if they are having those conversations, going back to that victim blaming those questions of why don't you just leave? Mm -hmm. um, all of those things can continue to perpetrate trauma on people. Yeah. And I think it all, and I think also what I was going to say is that it goes back to that first question, right? That first response. It's helping them develop a deeper level of insight about the situation and the circumstances and the um, and experience that they're having, right? Because we can say a clinician or a service provider can say all day, you are not safe. You are not safe. But if the person does not believe that they're not safe, they're not, there's nothing you can do about that. And so you can talk into you are you you are out of breath to this person um, rather than coming out of uh, coming coming towards um, the client as a this is what should be done this is what you need to be do we need to get you to safety blah 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 it should be it should be definitely be well what can I do for you do you want to stay do you want to go do you want to plan what does this look like for you and how can I support you with that I think that's the most important thing. And just to piggyback off of that, um, it is important to ask these questions because for the Latino immigrant community, um, if she makes a report and he goes to jail, most likely, highly, there's a high chance that ICE will pick them up and transport them to the detention center in Tulsa. They'll be there about roughly two weeks and then they're deported and then he's back. Um, so that's a huge safety issue is that something that they might risk of them coming back, um, going through all that trouble. So, and then we have a small window to get them relocated. Um, and then where do we relocate them to? They have no finances. Um, they don't have a social security number. So there's no electricity, there's no gas. 
Um, so we are dealing with someone who might look homeless, but can't get into shelter because they're not, they're ha their lethality or the score might not be at that level um, where they are accepted to shelter. So what do we do with her or him? What do we do with them? And start with that. It, it's very <laughs> stressful um, to start. We need to really know and be educated in different communities and learning how to serve them. Because honestly, it, it's it's sad that Oklahoma only has two certified agencies that are culturally specific for domestic violence, which is LCDA and myself. So those two culturally specific are only for Latinos. Um, but what about the rest of us out here, right? Uh, the We don't have, we're like we sometimes serve the Asian community um, because they feel like they might identify more with the cultural background of the Latino morals and values, um, as well as immigrants from Jamaica. They feel more identified with our services. So it's it's one of those things where you, like he said, you know, educating yourselves as advocates on different cultural issues and asking questions. Like asking, you could ask me any question you want whenever, um, shoot me an email. But it's it's always for the client's best, right? So like if we're all educated on these issues, then we're all going to serve the Latino, the whoever walks in the door at our best. Um, and that's that's the idea of working together and really eliminating or working against domestic violence. For me, it's not about what Hira knows, is what Hira can share for all of us to serve them at our best. Um, because like he said, it, it's horrible. Um, the, the system is not good for us. <laughs> um, we've had clients get deported before from the court hearing. Um, it, it's I mean, there's stories to go on and on and on um, of the ways that the system has failed. And we're only talking about domestic violence. We're not even talking about sexual assault victims or stalking victims um, in you know, the, the Latino community or the immigrant community when seeing these vi other victimizations. Anybody else want to add anything? Well, I, I want to add, as she was talking, uh, you know, thinking about legal systems and how much, the, how, much, how much the legal system often fails survivors who may have their own background or record of some sort of crime or whatever, they are often not believed because it's like, oh, you have this on your record or oh, you've done this in your past. And it makes it that much harder for them to receive services if they're not being believed by the people that are supposed to be protecting them because of something that happened in their past. Or sometimes they're shamed um, because they don't speak English. Um, you've, I've, I was in VPO court and I heard the judge ask my client, um, you've been here for 20 years and you still don't know English? And it's like, um, your honor, she's been a victim of domestic violence for 25 years. So that's the whole point of isolation. <laughs> I think uh, we should get our VPO just because of your statement. Um, so we do hear that, that they don't, there's really no support in getting interpreters for victims. Um, Do judge Dondurant, she's been doing this I believe she's the first judge that I've seen that has taken upon herself to have an, a Spanish interpreter. She has Spanish docket on Fridays. That's the first time ever. Um, you go to any other court um, that it's not criminal and they have to bring their own interpreter even though they're victims. And interpreters, I mean, if you're bilingual and you could dominate both language really well, um, that should be your job there. It's $150 per hour. Um, so a lot of our clients, they don't have the funding to pay 150. And if you know anything about like family court, it could be two to three hours. So we're talking about easily $500. Our clients don't have that type of finance. Um, and the court doesn't provide an interpreter neither. They are already losing by just trying to get their children or trying. And then um, a lot of the times we've seen that the, the 
the judge doesn't even understand domestic violence. They're granting custody to the father um, and, and here she is with a high lethality score and they're not really understanding that this is a victim or they're yelling at them in court because she's not understanding what's going on and the interpreter that she brought at a low cost is not really explaining to her that she needed an attorney. It's not really <laughs> a suggestion. Um, there's just so much barriers that we see in court and that they're, re they're being re-victimized in court. I am piggybacking on uh, the service providers because I actually had um, my client not too long ago. She, um, her ex-husband knew where she lives. We were trying, working on relocating her. Um, she couldn't leave her unit because of say, um, there wasn't any, there weren't enough shelter options. She needed shelter. However, she, the shelters were full. She didn't have a high enough lethality. Um, the closest shelter was three hours away and she doesn't have transportation. She uses the bus. The bus is gonna take her three hours back and forth. So she decided to stay where she was at. Um, abuser kept coming by and you know he would uh, attempt to assault her break down her door and you know she would call the police every time um, and the police would basically tell her like why don't you have a vpo why don't you have a vpo um we can't do anything because you don't have a vpo and this kept again that re-victimizing of like well you don't have a vpo so we can't do anything for you but what they didn't know is that like that would have been a flashpoint for her because he had threatened to kill her if she ever got a vpo and the fact that he already knew where she lived why would she go run and get a VPO at that point? Like that, that's putting her even more in danger. And so I feel like it's the unwillingness to learn. Um, I had sort of the same thing happen with a landlord when we, um, they were talking about criminal history and your background. My client had some domestic um, assault charges on her background, you know, from protecting herself, you know, but people don't read into that. They don't ask why. So I had a landlord ask me, uh, she just said on the phone, she's like, what's, what's up with her? Is she a fighter? Does she like to fight? Um, and, you know, you kind of have to take a minute to really realize like some people really just do not understand what domestic violence or intimate par partner violence is or what it entails. And it's not because someone likes to fight. It's because someone is trying to survive. Um, but the unwillingness to learn and educate themselves on that, it's really hard to deal with when you're trying to do your job and advocate for that person when the other person honestly doesn't really care to learn about it or be educated about it at all. Anyone else want to add anything? There's a lot of really good discussion, a lot of helpful things shared. My next question, um, Ladesha kind of already mentioned some of these things, but um, it's kind of a really good segue into um, the next question that survivors are often given the advice. They're told like, oh, just go get a restraining order, go get a BPO. Um, what are some reasons that that might not be the safest option or even an option at all for a client? I think for me, the most obvious one is law enforcement. Um, I think for um, Black Americans, um, calling law enforcement, that just because this person is hurting the victim, the perpetrator is hurting the victim, doesn't mean that they don't still love this perpetrator. Doesn't mean that they want this perpetrator to die. So in by inviting law enforcement into the situation, um, they could be putting themselves or the perpetrator in danger. And so that's a factor to think of um, when you're thinking of Black Americans. I think also another kind of barrier in that situation is the to charge someone means that they're going to be put into a system that they, that is, again, is not made for them, right? And so it, just because this, per, this person is hurting them, the survivor may may not want this person to have probation or have to pay for um, outlandish fees um, to the court. Um, they may not want this person in jail, right? They just want the abuse to stop. Um, and so they may be considering that because at the end of the day, 
because they're being hurt doesn't mean that they don't love this person. Doesn't mean that they don't want this person to be safe, even though this person's not safe with them. And I think it's important to remember too that nobody knows the situation as well as the person that's in it. So that survivor is going to know what, what the triggers are, what sets this perpetrator off. They're going to know these things and giving them advice that they didn't ask for isn't going to be helpful mm -hmm. um, because they there's a lot of things that they've probably already considered and they know why it's not going to work. And so just telling them what to do or asking them why they're not doing a certain thing, they're going to know why they're not doing that. Um, I agree with both of you. Um, I think for the Latino community, like he said, you know, they just want to be safe without violence. They don't want the perpetrator to go to jail or get deported. Um, because if he gets deported and not, and she's not working, then who's going to take care of the household? How is she going to survive if there's no family here? So there's a lot of obstacles that come from just making the call. Um, and yeah. So just piggyback <laughs> off of what they're saying. And um, we, I like telling our clients that yes, we are educated and we went to school. We have a lot of training. However, we're not the experts, they are. So handing them that power of making decisions on their own, um, I see it as um, you know, going from an aggressive perp and then an advocate who wants all the control going to a gentle perp, right? Because you're still mm -hmm. controlling them. You're still telling them what to do rather than making options for them, you know, option A or option B or even option C for some clients. Um, everyone, every, we all deal with trauma different. And like um, they had mentioned earlier, you know, if we have a uh, previous trauma, it only makes our logic of really problem solving um, a little harder. I know that in the Latino community, a lot of the times um, as kids, we're not allowed to think or even say anything. So being raised in a household where you don't know anything and you're being told you don't know, um, you get to a situation where you need to think and problem solve and it becomes super complicated. So teaching them how to problem solve with basic things, um, having plan A and plan B and thinking about what the outcome might look like and what would be um, like the returning factors of that option um, for them to really put that in practice and one day not need our services. We don't want people to be in our services for really like forever. Um, we want them to just go through the system and become survivors and learn these things for them to become survivors on their own because a lot of the times the abusers are making all the choices. So they go from an abusive household, maybe with narcissist parents to this abusive husband and they don't really get to learn these skills um, until they come to like our program and we're having them learn how to problem solve um, how to to you know look for money um, how to sell tamales and make an income um, without having um, a social because we can't guide them where to go because that's a great um but just really being resourceful on on the skills that they already have for them to survive anybody else have anything they want to add to that And I just want to remind that anybody who's like attending, if y'all have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask. Um, so you're more than welcome to do so. Um, so <clears throat> what are some ways that you feel like our court systems um, enable domestic abuse? or just our laws in general? Uh, failure to protect, that's one. Um, when you think of um, the ratio of male judges to female judges, how do you think they're going? Um, think about reproduction rights. 
Um, if the male, if the perpetrator is male, um, and using reproduction um, coercion as a tactic of coercion and control, um, we don't have laws that protect that person. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's it's a whole it's, it's a whole situation, right? Because mm -hmm. again, these laws and systems are not created for women. They were not created for black women, and they were not created for sexual minorities, right? And so having to navigate those is very, very difficult and scary. And that's what we're here to do, right? Is to help them navigate it in a way um, that they can get what they need um, without having to compromise who they are or put themselves in their danger. I think, again, just going back to if, if the victim or the survivor has any sort of record, or they have maybe it's violent charges or they have a substance use history, they're less likely to be believed and less likely to be offered or given the same services that other people are. Um, you know, I've also worked with clients who have called the police or have gotten involved in the legal system and there should have been a lethality assessment done and there wasn't because there just wasn't enough evidence or there wasn't enough um, proof that something happened. And so it just gets blown off. And so I think the unwillingness to believe people within these systems um, is just really harmful. I agree that proof is a, um, a big thing. So I feel like people, like anytime someone makes a claim about something being wrong or an issue, people want to see physical proof. They're like, oh, you were abused and where's your marks, you know, where's your proof, where's your evidence, did you take pictures, did you go to the hospital, did you do this, um, but like, you know, a lot of our clients, again, if they've been in a relationship and married for like 20 plus years, they've never had control of the finances, they don't even know how to make it, maybe how to pay a bill, or they can even tell you the cost of their water bill last month, because they don't get access to any of the finances, and so, like, financial abuse, you can't really have proof with that, and so I think it's, um, trying to expand our minds and again, willing to be educated on what it looks like, not just, oh, this person claims they were abused. Where's the proof? Where are the marks? Because it's more than just marks, let alone like, you know, the trauma and everything that comes with it. And so I, that's what I like to say. I had another thought. And what we were not talking about is indigenous women. Um, the fact that they're not protected under the law because of um, if they're part of a tribe or live on tribal land, um, a white male can go in and do just about anything to them and not receive any type of, not receive any, any accountability. At least, well, we don't have accountability even if you're not <laughs> on indigenous land. Well, we're all our, you know what I mean. Um, but, what happens is, is we, we're not talking about how we can better assist indigenous women um, in a way that is substantial and meaningful. Um, so I, specifically, I think, again, this is not a woman's issue, it's a men's issue. So if a male feels like they can, if a male perpetrator feels like they can do whatever they want to and be safe under the law to an indigenous woman, they are going to. Right. And so it just creates a whole web of craziness. Anybody else want to add anything to? You know, there's a lot that we could kind of discuss under that question kind of the ways that our laws and systems enable domestic abuse. I think that everyone kind of answered um, greatly. Um, we here recently, just hearing everyone, uh, we had a client that came in for intake and she brought a binder. And um, before we started, she pulled out all the evidence. Um, but we already had screened her. Uh, we already had her results. Um, so we knew she was a victim without the evidence, but she was determined to show us the evidence. Um, we went over the evidence with her. I didn't want it to be dismissive. Um, and we went over the power 
and control wheel. And I told her that we already had determined that she qualified for our services because she was, she is a victim of domestic violence and she got teary. Um, I believe it was the first time that her victimization was valid um, without the evidence. Um, and it's that, it's that we, I think that everyone, not just my community, I think that we oversee domestic violence as a joke. Um, it's been um, played to be just women. So when there's men seeking services, it's very shame more shameful. Um, it takes more guts um, for a man to seek services. And also it takes more guts for a man in the LGBT community to seek services. Um, so we're always, we're faith-based. Um, but we're always happy uh, when we serve someone from the LGBT community because we know that it takes double the power, not minimizing anyone, but it does take double the power to come to a faith-based organization um, to seek services. Like, I believe, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I just, you know, just, it feels good for me as a founder to have someone that, um, society might think that we don't serve come and seek services so it's like a little yay uh, moment for us um but we see that they're being underserved as well um a lot of the times they're not even they don't even want to take their report um so that frustration um because you know they are from the lgbt community or and because they don't speak english it doubles up in in the way that the community um or that victims, not the community, victims um, are being underserved as, as in all, in, I guess, nationwide. I don't want to just say Oklahoma, because I think that it's a nation, a national worldwide problem. Um, and understanding the culture um, also in Central America is very important for serving Latino community, the Latino community here. So I've been blessed to go and serve um uh, visit uh the latino community the central ecuador salvador guatemala and mexico and i've learned a lot um as a latina americana american they don't consider me from the motherland they think i'm from here um they um they have different rules they have different settings um i could tell you that we were having lunch with a family and the daughter had to come and open the soda can for her father right and it was mind blowing. Like my kids, uh, my husband, we were all just shocked, but it was normal. So understanding what their normal is makes it a lot easier to kind of, to help them um, when serving victims of domestic violence and um, understanding how they are, are being, like where that stigma comes from and how like to serve the LGBT community as well. Understanding that it, like the, the immigration community. I feel like every time I pause, like it's awkward silence. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to add that it's also really difficult for clients with mental illnesses. Um, I had one recently who was the one that called the police uh, to report the DV incident and they do have mental illnesses and the perpetrator was able to convince the police that they needed to be hospitalized and they were put on a 24 hour hold and have been re-victimized throughout the entire process and now doesn't trust law enforcement, doesn't trust the courts. Um, I, I spoke with this client on the phone for an hour yesterday and I think th they just needed someone to validate because the mental illness, like even if it's not severe, like this client was even stating just his ADHD was making it really hard and he was getting amped up and word vomiting. And he was just telling me how he was struggling um, because everyone thinks that he's crazy and he's just trying to get his story out and feel believed. And by the end of the conversation, you know, he's gotten down three levels and is completely, you know, coherent, but when they don't feel believed, especially when there's mental illnesses at play, like they're just being constantly re-victimized and not believed throughout the entire process. And, and that's that's a big struggle for a lot of mine. I, I know a lot of you probably have homeless clients that have a lot of mental illnesses. I, I deal with the same and 
you know, and then with animals involved as well, like it's so easy, especially if they're on the street and mentally ill and trying to care for an animal to be constantly re-victimized because they're out there alone and they don't trust anyone. And so that's a really, really big gap, I feel. I was gonna say, I feel like, I mean, at this point, it's not like, you know, the research and data is not out there. Um, and are our justice systems like just continued like the the lack of trauma informed anything? I, I mean, it's it's willfully neglect willfully negligent at this point. Um, you know, if if most of society understands the effects of trauma, but our justice system refuses to, I mean, how do you bridge that gap? I mean, they won't even mandate trainings for judges. I just keep repeating bow. Right? That's, what it, that's what it boils down to. Uh, what Re Annan, um, what she was saying is that that's what it boils down to is the power, right? The people in the justice, the persons in the justice system, the status quo, they have the power to maintain that status quo. And it's up to us who um, vote, we vote these people in, right? We tell these people, hey, go ahead and do this, right? We do it without question. And so I think that that's part of the thing is making sure that both professionally and personally, we are advocating and taking steps to stand up for our clients, to stand up for survivors, to stand, to be present, not just in um, the capacity of our professional life, but also in how we vote, also in how we spend our money, also in the things that we do to ensure that we're doing everything possible to make sure that the systems and the things that are being supported by us are also supporting our clients and the communities from which we um, live. Mm -hmm. I still love Amazon though. <laughs> Anyone want to add to any of that? I was just going to say really quick, I had a client tell me one day, um, she said our, our justice system isn't broken, it's working exactly the way they intended it to. <laughs> I think that money, money makes everything a lot better. Um, does, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter about race, it's a, it, the only color that matters is green. How much money do you have? If you're, if you have the money to hire a great lawyer, it doesn't matter. I, I've i seen it, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, and a lot of the times our clients are married to individuals who have a lot of wealth um, and they're immigrants and their, their status depends on their partner. And so we see a lot of fear and we see a lot of injustice when it comes to that because I mean, legal aid does great work, but an attorney that's getting paid a couple of thousands an hour, it makes a huge difference um, on the representation that they're getting in court um, and what they're getting in court. Um, so wealth is one of those things that I believe uh, matters when serving victims. Not to mention most barriers have to do with money. <laughs> like eliminates yeah. a lot so of barriers. The thing, the thing that Riley was mentioning um, on what Tyra, I, Jaira was saying was that there, the more money, if you are paying a lawyer that much amount of money, they're probably not overworked and they're going to be able to spend enough time to focus on the case. Uh, also, um, they're probably going to have connections 
to those in power, to status quo, to those levels above. They can go into the judges' chambers and would be like, look, he ain't do nothing. He just got drunk and mm -hmm. like acted the fool, right? Um, and so being very aware of how that how money um, can undermine justice and accountability. Because essentially, we equate everything to race and gender. But as um, Jara, is it Hyra or Jara? It's Hyra. Hyra, Hyra. As Hyra was saying, it all boils down to money. Race is about money, socioeconomic. Gender is about money, socioeconomic status, right? And so, yeah, absolutely right. And I wanted to add with uh, Ryan had mentioned about statistics. There's not a lot of statistics for people of color when it comes to domestic violence. So the lack of information, once again, um, the Lat for the Latino community, we have statistics from the 90s. <laughs> it's not that long ago, okay? That was just a couple of years, two, three years ago, um, because then I feel old. Um, but it, it's sad. It's sad that we're a growing population. There's a huge need for the Latin for Latino statistics and everyone else's statistics, not just the Latino, but there's none. Um, there are old statistics from Casa de Esperanza from the 90s and um, everything else is really just focused on Anglos with white statistics, which is really, I mean, it's kind of sad to try to serve a community, give them the the newest and the best statistics out there. And it's, there's hardly any to give to our community of color. Anyone else wanna add anything to any of that conversation? So I do want to give it kind of each of the panelists a few minutes just to kind of share anything about their programs or um, any like kind of closing remarks, anything like that that they may want to share. Um, we do have two more panels coming up. You can find them on our website. So we've got um, one focusing on um, centering the needs of survivors coming on Monday the 17th and then um, another one the following Tuesday the 25th focusing on building a community without violence so um, if anybody wants to attend those you're more than welcome to um, so we'll kind of go through um, each of the panelists if you want to share anything about your program closing remarks whatever you want uh, or nothing at all if you want um, I just want to kind of give you some space um, for that. So. I'll go ahead and start, I think. Um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, I guess I'll start with, uh, can you guys tell that I have like ADD and like, <laughs> um, I love what I do. Um, the reason why I started La Luz or funded La Luz was because um, my mother was a victim of domestic violence. And there was a lot of lack of information that she didn't receive, even in a big city like Los Angeles. Um, there was not a lot of um, education on what domestic violence was and the impact that it had on us, her daughters. Um, so learning um, about like the effects on children of domestic violence has played a huge impact in my life and understanding me. Um, and I wanted to give back um, I also felt the calling that this was what I was created for, and I um, decided to start a nonprofit, La Luz, to help people like my mother, serving people like my mother, um, who were undocumented, um, hardworking, um, have all the great skills to become a survivor, but they were never polished. Um, so that is the goal here, is to love on them, make them feel loved, um, valued, and embrace them as who they are for them to be survivors. Um, so that's the motto that we have here. I'm a bit crazy, so, you know, I hug them every now and then. Um, but yeah, that's what we do here. And I'm 
I'm proud to say that we are like the only organization that is fully committed in helping Latino victims in the state of Oklahoma. Thank you. Uh, so Riley and I are work married, and we just decided that we're not getting divorced. Um, like we work for we work for a for profit hospital, right? So yeah, send your clients; they have to have insurance, unfortunately. Um, but I think for us, um, it's conversations like these. It's um, being still being connected to organizations such as the YWCA and Palomar um, that allows us to really still feel connected to meaningful work um, outside of the humdrum cubicle um, kind of um, clinical work that we do. Um, I also want to just kind of like thank everyone because there's a lot of faces that I know, a lot of faces that I don't know. Um, so thank you for giving us the space to have this discussion um, and share some thoughts and ideas and hopefully um, hopefully inspire some new thoughts or ideas for others. So, yeah. And I just want to say I'm very, very thankful for opportunities like these and thankful to have had the opportunity to work in these settings just because the experience that I gained as well as my own personal experience have been able to really inform my practice and make me a better clinician with the clients that we work with. Even if it is for mine. <laughs> and did you, do y'all do inpatient or just outpatient? Or uh, so the hospital, so Oakwood Springs has um, both inpatient and outpatient services. Um, the inpatient services is covered by state insurance, so Medicaid, um, that includes um, detox, that includes um, mental health services. Um, and that's the inpatient side. Our outpatient side, uh, it's more of a private insurance type of situation. And inpatient also takes private insurance. Oh yeah, inpatient takes private insurance too. We take all your money. Uh, if you got the monies, we don't take it. Uh, the outpatient services um, offers two different levels of services. So partial hospitalization, where you're coming um, for the same amount of hours that you receive inpatient, but you get to go home at the end of the night. So that's between five and six, four and five hours a day. Um, and then we also have intensive outpatient, um, which allows a person to um, go to work and um, kind of reintegrate back into their regular scheduled program. Um, and that's just a few hours a week. I think three five or six hours a week. Yeah, um, that's nine hours a week, three hours for three days a week. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, and so those are our outpatient services. So yeah, um, that's what we offer. We also, if you have veterans um, that are veterans or active duty um, clients, um, we also um, have a unit that specializes in um, veterans and um, first responders, veterans, and active duty. So, yeah. We'll be sending a lot of clients your way. Ladesha, Brittany, either one of y'all want to go first? Next. I'll go. Um, I think my final comment I just wanted to say is there is not enough affordable housing. Um, as being a housing navigator, um, some of our um, clients are coming from a two income household to now a zero income household if the abuser was sole provider or to a one income household now. Um, and of course there maybe could be anywhere from one to five children involved. Um, so trying to you know get them connected to resources that can be able to help them, um, let alone just being able to afford rent is hard. Um, we do work on getting clients on housing subsidies, which people may also know as Section 8. Um, we do work with getting clients on that if need be. Um, I would say about a good 80% of our clients, um, if not more, are on some type of housing subsidy because, again, there's just not enough affordable housing. And so, um, that's my complaint. <laughs> but uh, I said, uh, I work with the Homeless Alliance. The Homeless Alliance does work with um, housing homeless individuals if they meet criteria. Um, but I specialize on the domestic violence side and I am embedded here at Palomar. And so I do the same thing as Homeless Alliance, but my specialty is working with the domestic violence victims. Um, 
And if you have any questions, feel free to email me or uh, get my information. I'll be more than willing to try to answer them as best as I can. Okay, my turn. Um, I guess so my final thoughts would be that I just hope everyone realizes, you know, how big of a barrier that pets are to safety and that it needs to be discussed and part of the conversation everywhere because it is such a priority to our clients and it should be a priority to us as well. And there's so much overlap, even with Ladacia saying there's so few housing resources, it makes it even fewer when I've got a client with three pit bulls and there's breed specific legislation and there's um, bans and at all these complexes and within all these housing situations. And it's so incredibly difficult uh, when you add that element onto it. And it definitely needs to be part of the conversation. And then there's just the link to from animal abuse to offenses against women and children and child abuse and homicide and sexual assaults. Like these things all overlap and it needs to be part of the conversation across the board. And I desperately need foster. So if it anybody wants to take an animal, uh, please come see me. I'm happy to have you. And the foster uh, link for is on the Palomar website, right? And okay, humane. So if you go to the Palomar's website, there's the animal advocacy program section, same for okay, humane. And the link to the orientation is right there. And it's completely like self paced. So you can go through it on your own time, uh, fill out the documents, send it to me, you'll be all signed up and start receiving emails. There's a Facebook group. I have a dog today that needs a foster. So let me know. So if you don't want to foster what about cats, you foster cats. Did you say cats? I do all animals. I've had goats, rabbits. I had a request for pigs, any oh, animal. Oh, I'm not messing with no goat. Yeah, <laughs> livestock are actually part of the conversation of like that they're a barrier to safety as well because many perpetrators will kill livestock. So I will foster anything that I can find a foster for, even a fish. So yes, I get a lot of cats. I have two cats in the program right now. Didn't you have a lizard one time? I think Elizabeth had had a lizard. I haven't had a lizard oh, okay. yet. I'm happy to have a lizard or a snake. I I love like my farm animal friends though, but the the rabbits are crazy expensive. So rabbits are, you know, not my favorite. Um, but yeah, the goats were really fun. They ate a lot of my paperwork in my office and they were all over my desk and that was a good time. <laughs> and you can specify what animals you're comfortable with. Just yes, I don't just send you whatever. <laughs> draw out of the gumball hat. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much for the panelists. I know we went a couple of minutes of overtime. So thank you so much for all the panelists and thank you so much to all of the people who attended. I know a lot of people had to jump off already, but um, just thank you so much for spending some time with us today and kind of having this conversation. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you guys are, will attend the future panels. Thank you so much.